Kentucky Searles era at Georgia is going. I'm going to give you just kind of a small, sort of a small look at that. And then just kind of a general thought of kind of how I see Georgia fans reacting to news like this and what I can agree with, what I can't agree with, and we'll kind of figure out that it's going. Uh, William Perry says, is this live or is it recorded? B? No, this is live right now. <laughs> I should go down the hallway and find a copy of the AJC and start holding it up so I can prove almost like a hostage video that this is the uh, day of the show. We did a week's worth of live shows, but we're kind of, or I should say a week's worth of pre-recorded shows, but we're not kind of back doing all this live again like we uh, typically do. So uh, we are live here as per usual. A couple more uh, comments. We'll get ready to roll in. Uh, Allison Scally, always great to see you here. Uh, somebody says, uh, bringing back Searles. I hope this doesn't start a trend. Who's next? Willie Martinez. And, I think there is some thought along those lines of, boy, this is a lot of, you know, previous names being brought back. And I get the, I I do get the somewhat lack of enthusiasm about that, but I also think all these are kind of to be taken on a case by case basis. I mean, Brian McClendon is also a former Georgia guy now back in the fold. Does, does anybody think that's not a big time hire? Maybe, maybe there are people who do, but I think of the McClendon things a pretty big time hire. The Serrells thing, I, I don't know what, quite to make of that yet i have you know curiosity about this the same way that some of you do so i'm willing to kind of t- treat the mcclendon thing and the sarah's thing as two totally different deals I-, I think the mcclendon thing was a pretty big hire i think it was pretty well received when it happened the sarah's thing i think maybe justifiably is a little bit more of a wait and see type approach and as we said before i think people have just made too much of the bobo thing all the way around bobo is a analyst making 100 grand which is a lot of money for you and me but is not necessarily a lot of money for someone in the major you know coaching rank i think that salary dictates his influence on the georgia program and we'll probably get more into that a little bit there too i think just people have kind of exaggerated the friendship and the impact that that's going to give him over what's happening here at georgia especially in light of the success that todd munkin is enjoying but we'll talk more about that later on uh j bob says i'll trust kirby smart on this one scott harris says i'm fine with everything else just don't bring back brian schottenheimer and that is probably a a pretty good thing a uh, pretty good idea to keep in mind all right so good comments we're gonna roll in we're gonna have a fun show connor riley stops by all kinds of really good things are we on the other platforms by the way so facebook youtube twitter twitch hello to you live on video little more on the big hire yesterday and a little bit of thought about hey how is all this going some of that we won't know until the season. Some of that we won't know until next year's signing day. But maybe a brief snapshot to give you an idea of how it's going right away. I'll give you that off the top of the program today. In fact, let's do that right now. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It's presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Dial 678-ESOG now for a solution to your foundation and waterproofing problems. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. You know, one of the things I try to do around here is be as candid as possible about my feelings. I try to give you the story behind the story as much as I possibly can. And here is something you probably already assume to be true, and I'll just acknowledge that it is. This show is just way more fun to do when everybody's happy, when everybody's excited about something. It's just a more fun show to do. It's probably good for business as well. But in terms of just the daily operation, it's kind of fun to do the show when everybody's happy. And so because of that, there is probably a little bit of a gravitational pull in my mind towards getting folks excited. Hey, it's good when everybody is excited. So if I can find an angle that's going to excite people, I probably do in my mind gravitate towards that a little bit. Hopefully I'm never dishonest and hopefully I'm, you know, never, you know, trying to contrive something that doesn't exist, but but there's always going to be kind of a natural tendency to gravitate towards something that's going to excite the UGA fan because the show is just fun to do and everybody's excited. And so when there's a thing that happens that you kind of judge the reaction to and you can watch our video comments you can read the you know responses to our social media stuff the comments to the stories at dognation.com when something that happens that doesn't elicit a whole lot of excitement it's one of those things that can be left you're kind of left trying to say what do we make of this then if, if everybody's kind of not really on board if everybody's not really all that jazzed about it then then what do we kind of make of and I think we have one of those things going on right now. Georgia hired an offensive line coach yesterday, Stacey Searles. It's a guy that a lot of Georgia fans are aware of because Searles also worked at Georgia from 2007 to 2010 as offensive line coach, kind of bounced around uh, uh, you know, a few places after that, some years more successful than others. But it's one of those things, as someone who's a little bit of a hype man by nature, a little bit of a carnival barker by nature, as someone who just kind of likes to get people fired up, 
the Stacy Searles hire at first glance is a little bit harder to get folks fired up about it. It's a little bit harder to kind of conjure up that hype man, carnival barker type thing. This is not Georgia hiring Sam Pittman at the start of the Kirby Smart Air in 2016 when you had all kinds of first person, you know, kind of, uh, you know, almost like, you know, user reviews of, yeah, this is one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. And everybody's kind of lining up ready to tout him for how good he was. And it was very easy to get folks excited about Sam Pittman. As a Georgia fan myself, it was very easy to be excited about that because the, the, the reviews and the, uh, and the, and the ravings about Pittman were so easy to find that getting folks excited about Pittman was just kind of an easy thing to do. And then when Pittman leaves, goes and becomes Arkansas head coach, Matt Luke, even though I'd say the two years of Luke as offensive line coach here at UGA, were as i've said many times before kind of good not really great but on the immediate nature of of luke being hired selling uga fans on luke was also kind of an easy thing to do this was a most recent sec head coach big gregarious personality you know kind of deep recruit uh deep uh relationship with some you know, some key recruits and some things like that that in terms of selling luke as a value add to your staff that was kind of an easy thing to do now did that turn out to be true or not i guess different folks have different opinions but on the forefront of all that selling matt luke getting excited about matt luke was kind of a fairly easy thing to do by comparison i don't know that getting as excited about searles is quite as easy to do because of whatever georgia fans may remember about his time here prior to that some good some bad what georgia fans think of his resume around his time at uga also like a lot of longtime assistants there's some good there seems to be some bad the most recent performance at north carolina here in 2021 does not appear to be very good some of the talent level for the tar heels might explain some of that might not explain all of that we don't really know the point is it's a little bit of a hard thing to sell right now so what do you do about that well obviously we'll see the on-field results ourselves september october november december and in january for this upcoming season i told you yesterday to me the thing that matters most about the georgia offensive line coach and preparing to do this yesterday i was thinking about this along the lines of thinking it might be searles but not really knowing for sure that it was going to be but not really mattering either way that hey for now you know what i care about the most is how do you get something out of Amarius Mims and more out of Broderick Jones and return to health for Tate Ratledge, making him the very best he can be. You know, getting sort of short term thinking, you know, getting the most of the guys you currently have on the roster to me was going to be a very important thing for the Georgia offensive line coach. And we talked about that yesterday, but you also kind of have to wait until then to see all that the same way with the ultimate signing day hall December and next February to determine all of that and frankly for a you know a bunch of college football fans who are very are used to a very you know rapidly spinning news cycle waiting until December or January or February to know how good a coaching hire turned out to be that can kind of seem like a little bit of a long wait. And if there's a way to accelerate that, then around here, we're just going to, we just kind of want to do that. So let me give you kind of my thought on this quickly that for Georgia fans who want to get a sense of the Stacey Searles hire and how well it's working out. And if there's a chance that it might be better than they think it appears to be here's a little bit of a brief window into how we might learn something about that here pretty quickly i want to show you this uh right quick from request mckeldry this is a georgia offensive line commit spoke to jeff sintel over the weekend and this conversation is taking place prior to the hire of stacy searles and if you go and read the full story with mckeldry at uh, dognation.com he makes it very clear that he doesn't know who the hire is going to be um and, you know was not quite aware of that there at the time but he was asked about the status of his commitment, and he said something that I thought was both interesting and pretty honest. McKeldry uh, says about uh, his commitment status to UGA, says it's not really wobbly. I'm just trying to see who they bring in. And he says, I'm trying to build a relationship with them and see where it goes from there. I'm just really taking my time now and being patient, even though I am committed. So here's what Quez McKeldry, Georgia offensive line commit prior to the Stacey Searles hire being made, saying, hey, I'm committed to Georgia, but I do want to take some time to see how I click, how I gel with the new offensive line coach they hire. And who could fault him for saying that? Doesn't that feel like a very honest assessment of the situation that I've liked Georgia, but now Matt Luke's no longer there, uh, even though uh, one of the things that McKeldry also talked about was having a relationship with staffers other than just Matt Luke. But, but this is a reboot of the position coach, which obviously matters to him. And he says, listen, 
I want to take my time to see how well I click with this new guy. And I think that's just probably a very fair assessment of all that. And it gets me thinking about another Georgia offensive line uh, commit there as well. One of the big prospects I think that already exists here for this 2023 class for UGA, and that's Bo Hughley. This is a big name. A lot of folks are very well aware of him. And I think much the same way that McEldry says, hey, I want to take my time and see how well I click with this new guy. I think you could presume that Hughley, maybe to a degree, kind of feels the 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 same way. And I want to take you back to him on Twitter right after it was announced that Matt Luke was not going to be coming back to UGA and folks trying to kind of make sense of all that. You know, Hughley doing like a lot of recruits do from time to time, went back on social media to reaffirm his status there with UGA. Let me show you what Hughley said on Twitter. This is going back to February 22nd. He says, I am 100% committed to UGA, he says, go dogs, and gives you kind of the typical emojis that you sometimes see around stuff like that. So let's take these two statements from recruits kind of in tandem here for a moment. McEldry says, listen, I'm committed to UGA, but I want to see how I click with this new guy. Hughley hasn't gone so far as to say that as of yet, but we could presume that he probably feels at least somewhat the same way on that. So the Hughley thing here, I think, becomes a very interesting barometer for what Searles uh, Searles is able to do to connect with current recruits because you see here kind of a before and after it's almost like the weight loss type thing the before picture the after picture the before picture of Hughley is someone that even after Matt Luke's departure felt 100% committed to UGA so this is a guy that has a strong relationship with UGA and for folks who are kind of concerned about well how does Searles impact these kinds of guys well, if we hear in a couple of weeks, Hughley interviewed by Jeff Sintel or something along those lines, and he's like, hey, listen, I, I've met Stacey Searles. I love him. I feel good about that. Man, I, I'm, I'm ready to go on this. Well, at that point in time, doesn't it become one of those things where maybe Georgia fans should give Searles the benefit of the doubt a little bit? I mean, Hughley's the kind of player you'd want to win with in any recruiting cycle. This would count as a big win for Matt Luke or Sam Pittman before that, that if Hughley meets Searles, if they get to know each other well, if they click and connect well, and Hughley continues to sing the praises of UGA much the same way he has in the past, then don't you have to give Searles the benefit of the doubt a little bit that maybe it's a better hire than some, even me, some of us have maybe treated it to be? The same thing for a guy like McKeldry there as well, who's been kind enough to be a little bit more open about his process saying I'm committed to Georgia but I gotta I gotta see what this new guy is like I gotta see how this fits well if a guy like that says hey I met him I like his plan for the offensive line I like the way in which he connects with me then 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 don't we have to to kind of maybe judge Sarah's as hey maybe this guy could work out okay maybe this is one of those quick ways to learn some of that now conversely the opposite is true that if the next time we see Hughley on Twitter if he's saying hey I'm going to take some visits. I'm going to see what's going on. And maybe we might be left to conclude that the that the relationship with he and Searles didn't click right away or someone like McKeldry or anybody else that you might want to mention there in that same regard. But to me, if you're if you're wait and see on the Hughley thing, or I should say on the Searles thing, if you're wait and see on the Searles thing, this may be one of those examples where you don't have to quite, you know, quite wait so long to know exactly how some of this is working. Look at guys who are in the fold for UGA. Look at a guy like Hughley, who was even strong on Georgia after the departure of Matt Luke. If he stays that way, then maybe this is an example of uh, of Searles being the kind of coach that can still connect with elite recruits. And if this is one of those things where that relationship with Georgia seems to soften a bit, if he seems to be more intent and interested in taking a bunch of visits, then maybe some of the reserves and the uh, reservations and the concerns that Georgia fans have about Searles, maybe that'll you know, prove to be valid right there. The point is, is it's a small window. It's a it's a thing that you might not have to wait that long to see that if you're looking to judge just how well the start of the Stacey Searles era is getting off to the reaction to the recruits are going to get a chance to know him and learn about him very soon. Their reaction may tell us a lot about what we need to know. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Hello to you, and thanks for being with us. No matter how you get to us, 945, first and 15, dognation.com, Dog Nation app, 10 a.m. after that, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, radio, noon, Athens Sports Radio 963, Podcast, podcasts all over the place, wherever you find them, the Apple Player, the Spotify, everything else in between, posting the show at the world-famous dognation.com. Just really glad to have you a part of what we're doing here today and really, really appreciate our friends at Engineered Solutions of Georgia for making it all possible. You know, when it comes to foundation waterproofing issues, you know, I was enjoying beautiful sunshine, great weather last week, but I was hearing tell 
back here in the uh, great state of Georgia of some not so great weather, a lot of rain, things like that. And listen, anytime that happens, a lot of times you see some evidence of some stuff inside your house that's not supposed to be there, whether it be water creeping into the garage, the crawl space, a lot of basement issues. Sometimes basements just get even flooded, which is uh, you know one of those things you got to do something about. And uh, over the course of time, these kinds of water issues can also create those foundation problems too. Maybe you've already seen some evidence of something like that. Cracks in the wall, never a good thing to see. You kind of are left to wonder what might this be? Well, the truth is, I don't know. And oftentimes you don't know either. But the folks at ESOG Engineered Solutions of Georgia, they know because they have two full-time engineers on staff, smart people who can give you expert evaluation of your foundation or waterproofing issue that you might be dealing with. Also, these are proud partners of UGA, which means it's always nice to support those who support UGA. Longtime friends of ours here at Dog Nation. And I certainly appreciate you continuing to support those that support Dog Nation daily. So Everything about uh, Engineered Solutions of Georgia recommends itself, and I can't recommend them more heartily than I do. So let me invite you to give them a call, 678-ESOG now. That's the phone number. Simply dial 678-ESOG now, and that'll get you in touch with Engineered Solutions of Georgia. All right, we're going to get Connor Riley coming up in a moment. And with Connor, we're going to talk a good bit about his reaction to the Searles thing, his reaction to the Georgia fan reaction to this, and I'm thinking Connor will probably agree with me that it's for the most part been somewhat uh, lukewarm, maybe no pun intended after Matt Luke uh, moves on. And what is it exactly going on with the Matt Luke uh, decision to uh, move on? We'll do a lot of that with him, and I want to also get into kind of some of the Fran Brown stuff and some of the other stuff that's kind of gone on here over the course of the uh, last few days. A lot from the last week we kind of need to catch up on, and so we'll do a lot of that with Connor, who – did yeoman's work covering all that for us here last week while I was away, and I certainly appreciate that. Before that, though, let's do a brief version of Around the Doghouse here for a moment. And I want to go back in time here, and I want to play something from Kirby Smart and the national championship celebration there in Athens on that day, which we'll all remember of the great parade, the great celebration inside the stadium, and the final words of Smart that kind of punctuated the entire deal. And I play this for a reason, which I'll explain after you hear it, but here's a reminder of how happy Kirby Smart was on the day that all those national championship trophies were spread out all over the across that stage there at Sanford Stadium. This Kirby Smart from back in January. Excellence in leadership, excellence moving forward. We expect them to hold that same standard for a long time to come at UGA. So that brings me to this point, and this is how it ended. We're burning the boats, baby, and we're coming back. Go dogs! Thank you. We're burning the boats, and we are coming back. In other words, it's not quite a prediction that George is going to repeat as national champions, but it's certainly a reminder that Kirby Smart, I believe you would say, remains as committed to winning a championship in 2022 as he was in 2021. Now, all of a sudden now that George has got that monkey off its back, all of a sudden now Kirby Smart's not going to just kind of kick back and relax and basically rest on his laurels. That just doesn't quite feel like uh, what, what Smart would want to do. So in light of all of that, I think it's been interesting to watch the reaction to the Stacey Searles hire a little bit because I'm kind of amazed at even in the aftermath of some great success for Smart, there is an element to which some Georgia fans don't seem to want to give him the benefit of the doubt on things like this. And I don't mean to say that whatever Kirby Smart does, you have to treat it as if it's perfect. Like no man is infallible. And as a man, I'm not going to treat any other man as if he is infallible. We're not going to do that. We're not going to treat you know, men as if they are perfect because all men are imperfect. We kind of understand that. But there's an element to which that um, that a thing like this with the Searles hire, as I said before, where a lot of us feel like we kind of know what he is as an offensive line coach. A lot of us who look for reasons to be excited about UGA making coaching moves and things like that kind of look through the Searles resume or kind of remember back to his previous time here at UGA. Maybe we strain to find something to be excited about. Maybe most Georgia fans, a good number of Georgia fans, are left lacking in trying to do that. And so I think for some Georgia fans, their response that ends up being kind of one of two things. They assume that in this regard, Kirby Smart must be incompetent. And I don't mean to be flippant here, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic either. You know, I don't really know that there's much evidence to support any level of incompetence for Kirby Smart based on his previous coaching hires. And you can say, well, B.A., what about James Coley's offensive coordinator? And I've told you before, I thought the Coley hire was disastrous. I thought it was a big, big mistake for Georgia, not, maybe not going into it, but in the aftermath of it, obviously, clearly it was a mistake to have Coley as offensive coordinator. The Georgia offense suffered mightily because of that. 
But you don't prove your competence by never getting anything wrong. If that be the case, then no one would be competent in anything. So, so competence is not really proven by never getting something wrong. Competence is proven by frequently getting things right. And so when you look at the way in which Trey Scott has worked out for Georgia, the way in which Dan Lanning clearly worked out for Georgia, Glenn Schumann worked out for Georgia, you know, Todd Hartley is tight ends coach, uh, Dale McGee is running backs coach, on and on you go, uh, Todd Munkin as, as, as offensive coordinator. There is a large series of successful coaching hires for Kirby Smart. They're not all perfect. They haven't all been Grand Slam home runs. That is certainly true. But a good number of these have turned out to be successful. Therefore, that's a track record that I believe that assumes competence. So if, uh, if, if folks look at this and they say, well, Kirby Smart clearly doesn't know what he's doing by hiring Stacey Searles, I think the previous track record of coaching hires for Smart speaks to a level of competence. And so then it kind of gravitates towards, and this is the weirdest one of them all, that there's some sort of level of corruption here, which is, ah, this is smart doing a favor for his old friend, Mike Bobo, is here as an analyst, and somehow smart's going to put his own coaching uh, reputation in jeopardy to take care of a friend who wants to take care of what we presume is another friend, and this is Kirby Smart, you know, against maybe his better judgment bringing back all these old uga guys because that's somehow what mike bobo wants to do and for the life of me i'll never understand why when people see something like this there is a pocket of some georgia folks some georgia fans who want to assume the worst who want to assume that somehow this is about some sort of corrupt plan to you know take care of an old boys network of coaches some sort of cronyism system like like why would we automatically assume the worst about anybody in any situation but specifically kirby smart given the fact that there is so little incentive for him to do wrong by his by himself so little incentive for him to do wrong by the program that he's established especially on the heels of winning a national championship i've told you this now many times kind of in our comment sections away from the regular show but i'll say this now on the regular show too I think there is a pocket of Georgia fans who have made way too much out of Mike Bobo being hired as an offensive analyst on this program, uh, by this program, not the program Dog Nation Daily, but the program that's Georgia football. I think people have made way too much about that. Bobo is a relatively lowly paid guy who's kind of taking a break from on-field coaching, and he's doing that at UGA because he's got a bunch of family ties to the program, and admittedly he is you know, Kirby Smart's friend. But there is no evidence that, that Bobo is going to have any great influence on the program at all in fact there's plenty of evidence to suggest that he won't because of just how successful Todd Munkin was offensive coordinator and frankly if uh you know if if you know Kirby Smart wanted Bobo to be coordinator or on-field coach something like that he could have already done that before now but no the offense has been given over to Todd Munkin and on the heels of the great success that they enjoyed a year ago the idea that Kirby would then look at that and say okay we want to lessen your influence and give more influence to this guy uh because he's my friend I think a lot of people have kind of a weird assumption that smart might want to do that, even though doing that isn't really very well incentivized really at all. So it kind of brings us back to the point we had to start the show. I am kind of like some of you in that the Stacey Searles hire does not make 100 percent sense to me. I, um, I, I don't completely understand that. I feel like I have a little bit of an idea of what Searles time at Georgia was like and what his resume around his time at Georgia is like. And it kind of leaves me a little bit wanting something more from him or from this position or whatever else but but i'm a little bit lukewarm about this i'm a little bit less than fully enthused by this especially compared to the typical response we would normally have to georgia hiring an assistant coach so in light of that and once again i'm not trying to be flippant this is this is the really the way i try to approach stuff like that in light of that when things seem one way to me but apparently appear to be something different to kirby smart i assume that there must be something I don't know in light of what Kirby Smart does, as opposed to there must be something that Kirby Smart doesn't know in light of what I know. As I said before, I'm not trying to be flippant. But if Stacey Searles is being hired by Georgia at this time for this role, then he must be a better coach than I think he is. And he must be a better coach than his resume has suggested that he is because Georgia, for the most part, makes successful coaching hires. And frankly, if you want to get really deep in the weeds on this, look at guys like Kevin Steele and others. For these long-range assistant coaches who spend a lot of time you know, doing this as kind of a lifer, as a position coach level or coordinator level, the truth is a lot of them have up years and down years and kind of everything else in between. And kind of sometimes who really knows what contributes to success more so than anything else. But the point here is, 
is that if I respond to the Searles hire by saying, boy, this doesn't feel all that exciting to me, but yet Georgia hires him for this role one year after winning the national championship, then apparently Kirby Smart must know something I don't because it's pretty unlikely that I know something that Kirby Smart doesn't. And that's just kind of the way that I look at that. It's not my job to carry Kirby's water on this, not my job to carry Georgia's water on this. Frankly, you know, uh, the results one way or another will speak for themselves. But I am going to be somewhat slow to assume that I know more than the guy that's making the coaching hire when the guy who's made this hire has made so many other successful hires prior to that. So that's kind of my feeling on that. You obviously have your freedom to feel how you want to, but it is interesting to see the reaction to this right now the fact that it's been pretty lukewarm around Searles and the fact that some Georgia fans make, I think, some pretty wild assumptions about smart on the basis of what it is they think they know. So that's what I think. Let's find out what Connor Riley thinks. Let's do a Kroger fresh take with him. Also, before we're done, very interesting statements being made about coaches and quarterbacks in the SEC for the upcoming season. How does all that impact Georgia? We will talk about that. Plus, a lot of other news to get to from the last few days there as well. We'll try to cover it all right now. Kroger fresh take with Connor Riley. Glad to have him and all of you with us on the program here today. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. We'll say hello to Connor Riley, Kroger Fresh Take, diving into the Searles thing and everything else. And I, I guess, Connor, let me begin where I was there a moment ago. And, you know, frankly, it doesn't bother me that uh georgia fans maybe are a little bit lukewarm to the higher stakes these earls it's not necessarily my job to get them to feel differently about that than they do but you know i, I, I do think it's important to keep perspective on all of this so before i get your reaction to the searles hire what is your reaction to the reaction to the searles hire yeah i'm not surprised uh granted you know stacy searles time at georgia really predates my involvement at all when it comes to the university of georgia and you know, I don't know how much people want to hold that against him. I personally don't hold, you know, things that happened 15 years ago in terms of a coaching acumen against, you know, what Stacey Searles is and what he can be. I, I think the word that comes to mind here is ambition or in terms of the hire that was made, maybe a lack of it, especially just even given that offensive line job and how Georgia has hired there in the past. I mean, Sam Pittman was a home run swing and Georgia connected on that. Matt Luke, before he took the Georgia job, three weeks beforehand, he was a sitting head coach at Ole Miss and had an egg bowl turned out differently. Maybe he, you know, doesn't end up being Georgia's offensive line coach there. So, you know, for Sarrells to be a retread of sorts, uh, you know, I understand the reaction to it and I see it. But at the same point in time, I think you did a good job outlining why. If you look at the hires that he's made and, and even looking on these Georgia offensive staff, I think fit has become very, very important to what Kirby Smart sees as sort of the next evolution of college football and of particularly Georgia in terms of having both players and coaches who fit the vision that Smart wants for his program. And I think Sarrell's, even with his past time here and even maybe not having a, the most sterling resume, I think taking, taking Sarrell's in is maybe a less risky move than going out and hiring perhaps a bigger name, but you don't necessarily know how he's going to fit and interact with the rest of this coaching staff. Most important thing is short-term. A lot of times I think I'm going to encourage you to think long-term about stuff like this, but for now it's think short-term. What do you get out of Marius Mims? What do you get out of a full season, hopefully of Broderick Jones as a starter? Getting Tate Ratlitch to show the promise after injury that he appeared to show kind of prior to that injury that for me right now it's not about hey how well can you recruit over the course of the next five years it's how well can you develop over the course of the next five months get something out of these talented players that you have and then we'll figure out everything else after that but coach these guys up you have to have the three guys that i just mentioned be among your five best offensive linemen last year and that job whether it be Sarrells or somebody else in this role that job is more important than anything else yeah, I think it's actually the perfect opposite of the other sort of retread hire that Georgia made for this coaching staff in Brian McClendon because McClendon, so much of him, I think, is just going to be judged what he does on the two signing days next year with the wide receiver class. With, with Sarrells, 
And, you know, his recruiting acumen is maybe a little bit better than I think some people give him credit for. Zach Rice, the number one offensive tackle in the 2022 recruiting cycle out of Virginia last year, signed with North Carolina there. So, I, you know, I think recruiting, especially in a place like Georgia, he's going to do a fine job with it. Kirby would not have brought him in if he did not have that belief. But to your larger point there, you know, I'm going to be really interested to see what happens with Amarius Mims this year because – Georgia brings back a guy like Warren Erickson. They bring back a guy like Xavier Truss, who's played more football than Mims. And Mims is obviously going to have to earn it, and he has as high an upside as anybody. But, I mean, I personally, sitting here right now, I don't believe at any point this year, Amarius Mims is going to be a better offensive tackle than either Warren McClendon or Broderick Jones. So you're in all likelihood moving him into guard if you believe he is one of your five best offensive linemen. And he's going to have to really beat out some veterans there. And so I understand – the want to see Sarles develop him. And I will include Tate Ratledge there as well. I would also say that it does have to fall on the individual players, some in Mims particularly to go out there and prove that, Hey, you know, even though I'm a five-star, I'm willing to work even at a position of guard where I do not plan on playing that long-term, but still finding a way to contribute and being one of the five best linemen for Georgia this season. Let me do a little bit more on the serials thing at North Carolina, and then I want to ask you something different here. You mentioned the big signing they did have. The internet says that Dre Bly was the area recruiter there, and maybe they don't want to give Serials full credit for that. I have no idea if that's true or not, but that's what the internet says on that. Here's the one thing I do know. They gave up sacks almost 12% of their dropbacks last year. Like, that's horrifying. Now, they also passed a thousand times. Uh, you know, they didn't have quite the same running game they'd had, you know, the year prior to that. I'm not an expert on North Carolina football. But that's still a lot of sacks, man. That's like 50 sacks. Uh, like, what do you make of the fact that the numbers were just so horrendous for North Carolina? Do you just kind of throw it out with the bathwater because it's a bad team, kind of a weak, you know, whatever? Like, what do you make of that? So, so and I, I know this might is a little sketchy right here. It's, it's more, more for conversational purposes. purposes. I don't know how closely you follow the NFL, NFL but did you, you know that – DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, and Dawson Knox, three really talented pass catchers, were all on the same Ole Miss team together. And that team, when those three guys were, I believe, in their final year at Ole Miss, they won five games that year. They didn't even go bowling. It's crazy. Do you know who the offensive coordinator for that team was? Uh, remind me. It was Phil Longo. Okay. So, and people often say, well, how did how did Ole Miss, you know, with that kind of offensive talent, only win five games? I tend to believe that Phil Longo had a lot of involvement in that. And I know people pointed at Matt Luke before. I believe Phil Longo has a lot of offensive influence at a place like Ole Miss. Phil Longo was the offensive coordinator at North Carolina last year. And I particularly don't believe he did a good job of consistently putting Sam Howell in a, in a position to succeed. Fair enough. In a position to just not get the target out of him as, as a quarterback. And I would point out as well, well, yes, Josh Downs is a fantastically talented wide receiver. They lost four skill players to the NFL last season. And I do think, as Georgia showed in 2019, when you have that much turnover and that much youth in your skill position there, I do think that that sort of contributes to the way that you have to play and adjust the next season. And I think it was very clear this year that when it comes to the offensive line, and yes, obviously, Sarrells probably should have done a better job there. To put all of the offensive line production on Sarrells when Phil Longo is very much involved with the calling of that offense there, I personally have a lot of questions about Longo and his ability as an offensive coordinator, more so necessarily than Sarrell's. Let's examine another variable here for a moment, because when something happens, I think there's a certain obligation that we have for the most part to treat things at face value. If somebody says something, we sort of have to believe them unless we have overwhelming evidence to do otherwise. So Matt Luke says, listen, I'm stepping away from coaching. I want to spend more time with my family. I'm essentially retiring from the game which maybe that's really what he's doing. But boy, that's an awful young age to be retiring from football forever, which leads you to believe, well, maybe there's more to this story than we are fully aware of. I've said now many times, I thought the Georgia offensive line last year was good, not great. The overall stat, think about line yards and sack rate and things like that for Georgia were actually pretty good. They were top 10 in line yards. They were top 20 in uh, in, in sack rate allowed. They, you know, pretty good offensive line but man you watch that a lot of times last year and it never really quite felt great so in other words are we going to assume that this really is just face value Matt Luke decided you know what coaching's not for me we talked yesterday about how hard the grind is and how Kirby Smart's even acknowledged how challenging this is for a lot of assistant coaches right now is that what this is or is there a chance that 
Maybe Georgia sees an, sees an opportunity to upgrade the performance that it's getting from its offensive line and an upgrade in the performance that the guy that's tasked with doing that is able to provide the program there as well. So, so B is a little, little bit of a conspiracy theorist, and I, I was a little uh, – when, when he was, was on vacation, vacation last, last week, I, I needed to hear his conspiracy theory on why Matt Luke really stepped down. down. But I personally choose to believe that it is family related. You look at Matt Luke in his sort of coaching career. When he finished as a player at Ole Miss in 1998, he went right into coaching. So he'd been doing this for over 20 plus years. And let's go back to his time at Ole Miss, the way that he dealt with all of that there and everything that went on with Hugh Freeze, him stepping in as the interim, him then becoming the full-time head coach. And then he gets fired from Ole Miss. And then just a few weeks later, he's back at Georgia up and running and running an offensive line there that obviously had to fill the shoes of Sam Pittman. And I think Sam Pittman, even though he is now, you know, almost three years removed from his job as the off- or the offensive line coach at Georgia, I still think his shadow very much looms large over this position in the sense that he is the standard that all offensive line coaches for the rest of Kirby Smart's tenure will be judged against. And I think the job that he did here, the, and even, you know, in, in two years time, really turning around an offensive line that, you know, for much of the early part of the 2010s had never been a strength. And then 2017, 2018, and even 2019, you can say that offensive line was a clear strength of the program and position the group to be in a spot where it theoretically should always be a strength. And I think this 2022 season still has some of Sam Pittman's fingerprints on it in terms of the offensive line and what's sort of being built here. So I, I think Pittman's shadow, so to speak, looms over this offensive line position and specifically Serrell's as well here. But Making it back to Matt Luke, I, I do legitimately believe that he wanted to spend more time with his family. Kirby Smart, and you played the clip yesterday, him talking about coaches, you know, either wanting to go to the NFL to spend more time with their families or in Luke's case, him just stepping away here. I, I do believe that with all that Matt Luke has gone through and his kids getting a little bit older and you as a dad, I think understand that as those kids get 10, 11, 12, as they get a little bit older there, you realize time is a lot more finite. And I think Luke recognized that and realized, Hey, I've got a spot here where I can spend the next couple of years with them. And if I want to dip my toes back into coaching, you know, three, four, five, six years from now, I still have the ability to do so. Also kind of interesting thing where there are a lot of Georgia staffers who have kids around that age, you know, playing high school football, doing things like that. And I, and I have some awareness of this that I know that's a very big deal for a lot of these guys getting a chance to see their kids playing high school football or whatever age of athletics that they're in, kind of in that like early teens, moving into high school type thing. I have no doubt that part of that is, is, is 100% real, that you only get one shot to watch your kids kind of go through high school like that, and you don't want to fully miss all that. I, I do completely understand that. However, I also have to acknowledge this. I thought the Luke hire when it happened was a really strong hire, and you laid out all the reasons why a moment ago. I also think in the little bit small interaction I've had with him, he comes across like one of the best dudes in the world. He just seems like he'd be a very easy guy to have dinner with or play golf with or something like that. So I've got a lot about Luke that I want to like. But looking at his two years here at UGA, I couldn't give him an A for those two years. I probably wouldn't give him a B plus. To me, it's a solid B when you look at the two recruiting classes, the two years of on-field performance. I'd give him a B. I, I can't give him a B plus, which means there is an opportunity for a value add with somebody stepping in here. Yeah, and one other thing I sort of wonder about, Luke, and I sort of wrote about it in a story this morning on Dog Nation towards the bottom there. Matt Luke was paid a lot of money. He was making $900,000. He was set to be the second highest paid assistant on Georgia's coaching staff next year. And with that money, I think comes a, a certain voice, especially in terms of, you know, offensive – input in terms of what you want to see and what you want to have from this team. I'd be stunned if Stacey Sherrill's is making $900,000 in Georgia next year. And with that in mind, you wonder if, you know, Luke stepping aside, if I, if I will waddle into the conspiracy theory waters here, you know, this being a sign of, okay, we want to give Todd Munkin even more of a voice, even more authority on this offense. I know he received a salt, a small raise a few weeks ago. Like similarly to if Stacey Sherrill's is making $900,000 next year, if Todd Munkin is only making $1.25 million next season, I have a lot of questions personally because he's done everything that has been asked of him. Won Georgia a national championship, played a huge role in that offensive coordinator role there. And personally speaking, when we've seen from coordinators and the way those salaries have exploded, Matt or Todd Munkin is worth a lot more to Georgia, I believe, than $1.25 million. So I am very interested with Luke now, you know, stepping away and Stacey Sherrill's coming in, 
how much more power, how much more of a larger voice and more amplified voice does Todd Munkin have at the University of Georgia? Because I do believe Matt Luke did have a pretty sizable voice within that Georgia team and within that Georgia offense. Along those lines, let me just let you respond to this. I think that the whole Mike Bobo presence in Athens is getting way too much attention from the average fan. Now, not every fan cares about it, but you watch our comment sections and things like that. A lot of folks are talking about Kirby's friend being back on staff, and a lot of people seem to be wanting to make, I think, some wild assumptions about this. I think that Bobo being here, making a hundred grand for, you know, watching film and sitting in on meetings, I think it's one of the most overanalyzed things around UGA football. Now I'm also a little bit more pro Bobo than not. I think he's a pretty good coach, even though the last couple of years would leave me asking some questions, but but I think that Bobo is more good than not. But the point is, I think that him being in Athens is about as much big of a non story as it can possibly be. But people seem to want to make it into something that somehow he's got Kirby's ear and he's he's you know uh, a trusted lieutenant in all of this. When I I think that Buster Faulkner as an analyst is far more important, I believe, than Mike Bobo as an analyst at this stage of his career. What do you think of maybe? Have you noticed the chatter that I'm noticing, and what do you think about it? Yeah. So one, uh, your point about Faulkner is correct. If if Mike Bobo were as important to Georgia as Buster Faulkner were. Mike Bobo would be, wouldn't be making $150,000 less than Buster Faulkner this year. And two, you know, you, you brought up there, oh, Kirby's hiring his friends. He's listening to his friend and, and whatnot. That might be true, but they're, ta- they're thinking about the wrong friend here. And I wrote about this yesterday and had a good feeling it was going to get blown off by the offensive line hire. Look at Will Muschamp and his involvement in this program. One, Will Muschamp made $300,000 last year as an analyst. That is three times what Mike Bobo is set to make this season. You look at when Scott Sinclair stepped or Scott Cochran, excuse me, stepped away last August, Muschamp stepped right in there. You look at this Georgia recruiting class. I think Muschamp played a huge role in Georgia finishing with the number three overall recruiting class. You look at some of the hires that Georgia has made this offseason. Mike Bobo, Stacey Sherrills, and Brian McClendon all have past experience working with Muschamp. And Bobo and McClendon served as offensive coordinators for Muschamp there as well. Look at the raise that he received, uh, going from $300,000 to $800,000, going to make the same amount of money as Glenn Schumann this season, both going to have that co-defensive coordinator title. I, I think it's all, you know, the, the listening to the friend and in, in giving, ceding power to a lieutenant, I think that might be true with Muschamp. I don't believe that's the case with Mike Boba at this point in time. And, and we're going to see over time how Bobo's role at Georgia evolves because I don't believe he's here for one or two years and looking to get back out there and go coach somewhere else. I think Similar to when Muschamp got here a year ago, it, Bobo is on sort of a multi-year track to be at Georgia for quite a while. And I still believe, having said all that, you know, if, if Todd Munkin has another successful year next year and gets hired to go be an NFL offensive play caller, I would think Buster Faulkner would have a much better chance, personally speaking, to be Georgia's replacement as that offensive coordinator than, say, Mike Bobo. I agree with you on that. Let me go through a couple other issues with you real quick, but remind folks before we do, this is our Kroger Fresh Take with Connor Riley here on Dog Nation Daily here today. And, of course, uh, when you think about Kroger, I want you to think about a brand-new membership opportunity they have for you. It's called Kroger Boost. Now, when you sign up for this, you get all kinds of savings and benefits, and it's an entirely new level of membership that I think you're going to really enjoy. You can get free grocery delivery, twice the fuel points, and so many other special offers there as well. And you can enroll for as little as $59 a year. So check out Kroger.com slash boost for a lot more on that. Kroger.com slash boost for a lot more on that. All right, Connor, let's do a couple of like rapid fire type things. Uh, You know, for me, coming back to work after being gone for a week, the Searles thing has completely sucked all the oxygen out of the rest of the room here. Really haven't talked about Fran Brown being hired as defensive backs coach at all, coming over from Rutgers. What was your reaction to the Brown news? And I guess kind of give me a thumbnail sketch of this with him being a staff member also now in the fold here for UGA. Yeah, so I think with Brown, you look at his background, you looked where he's worked, you figure to look at where he's able to recruit New Jersey, northeastern part of the United States. It's also not ignore the fact that he spent two years at Baylor, has worked in the state of Texas, has ties to the state of Texas there. The other defensive assistant hired this offseason, Judeo Uzo Uribe, also ties to the state of Texas, coached at SMU, was set to coach at TCU this coming season. So I think Brown, similar to Uzo Uribe, I think you're seeing sort of a, a plan in terms of what Georgia is looking for in assistance and how they can attack certain areas of the country. Uh, Brown comes very highly recommended from all that I have read, a dynamic recruiter, especially in the state of New Jersey, which has produced some very talented players over the year. Yeah. 
And, and I would point out there as well, in addition to the talent in the state of New Jersey, was also a, a, a head coach potentially for Temple, uh, I believe replacing Rod Carey there and, and has obviously worked a lot there in that area from Camden, New Jersey, the southern part of the state there. So I, I think, you know, you obviously the biggest thing with this comes down to fit because it, from all reports and indications, Jamila Dye just was not a great fit at the University of Georgia. How is Fran Brown going to fit in while working with Will Muschamp, while working with Kirby Smart in coaching up those defensive backs? I think that's going to be the biggest thing that determines how successful and how long Brown is at the University of Georgia. Yeah, you know, the EJ Lightsey thing is another thing we haven't really talked about here on the show, and it was so shocking to me. To hear. It's one of those things where, like, I really was unplugged last week. You know, I was very happy to be unplugged, did not really have access to my phone. But when I finally did check back on the news, that was one of the first stories that I saw. And Gosh, you know about shocking and and scary and everything else, Connor. You know what? What? what it just seems like an awful situation. What do you make of the uh, of the of the Lightsey shooting? Yeah, it's one of those. You know, as as a reporter, you know, I was aware of it and was seeing the tweets and seeing the social media interaction. It makes your stomach turn. You're just you're hoping at first that it's not true, and then from there, once it became apparent that it had happened. You're just hoping and praying that, you know, he's able to safely make it through it. And very fortunately, it sounds like he is and he's going to make a full recovery. But just a scary situation in terms of, of you know, seeing a guy who has so much promise going to the University of Georgia to be a linebacker and all that comes with that. And then in, a, in the span of a few hours, you're wondering, OK, well, how OK is this guy? He's been shot. He's being transported to a different hospital. Uh, very fortunate that EJ Lightsey looks like it's going to turn out to be okay because for a few hours there on Monday night last week, it was a very scary situation. My understanding based on kind of what I've heard is he was not targeted. He was just Mm -hmm. kind of almost wrong place, wrong time. Is that kind of your understanding of this? Yeah, that is my understanding of the situation. And, you know, it was from my understanding of reading the reports was shot twice in the back and shoulder. And, you know, very fortunate that if those bullets – you know, or a few inches the other way. It's a very different story we're talking about right now. Very fortunate and very much rooting for EJ Lightsey to put this well past him. It, it's every parent's worst nightmare. I mean, it just it just really is. You know, you just want to, I don't know, just protect your kids at all times. And, boy, you just never know, man. That's, that, that's a really, really scary thing. And kind of an awkward way for us to end our conversation, Connor, but I really appreciate your thoughts on – everything going on with UGA and obviously you've had some great stuff including a really good piece up today on Searles a good piece yesterday on Will Muschamp looking at these kind of final you know parts of the coaching puzzles that kind of comes together for UGA I hope folks will read that Connor thanks for being with us here today on our Kroger Fresh Take on Dog Nation Daily and we'll look forward to speaking to you very soon yep as always it was a pleasure to be Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Fruit. So I think Connor brought up a good point about something a moment ago in comparing Will Muschamp as an analyst a year ago to Mike Bobo as an analyst right now. This is not my intent to disparage Bobo because I think, you know, all in all, Bobo's a pretty good coach. But I do think that as an analyst, they were in very different parts of their career in that while Will Muschamp is kind of taking a step down from being head coach, he was still very much in demand as a defensive coordinator. This is a guy that was choosing to be an analyst at UGA by choice because he liked the idea, once again, you know, the idea of kids still in high school and getting a chance to watch you know, them play and, and stuff like that, also be around other family members there within the UGA program. There was a lot of reasons why maybe Muschamp did not quite want to step back into a defensive coordinator to a place like Texas or somewhere that he could have gone. Um, but obviously knowing he was in demand for so many other jobs, then his salary as an analyst is going to be a little bit higher. He's making like more like the three hundred grand type thing as opposed to like the one hundred grand type thing. For Mike Bobo, after being offensive coordinator at Auburn and not really going so great, and maybe the year before that at South Carolina at the end of the uh, Muschamp administration, you know, I think I think Bobo as an analyst right now is just kind of a little bit different place. I think you have to keep that in mind here for people who are like assuming that somehow, oh, this is all some sort of grand plan for kirby to resurrect mike bobo in some form or fashion as someone who thinks of mike as a pretty good coach all in all you know certainly going back to his end of his time there at uga i think he'd proven himself to be a very good offensive coordinator there at the end of his time there at uga i simply don't think that's what this is i think when you look at the way in which buster faulkner has been reported to be close with arch manning and the way in which the georgia offense has really hummed in the todd munkin world the fact that you know the when the uh, Mike Bobo time came to Colorado State that was the time which Georgia could have hired, uh, hired him right then chose not to do that I mean just kind of keep that in mind here that Bobo to me is an analyst for the most part like any other analyst 
he's someone whose football influence I think you're glad to have, whose football mind you're glad to have here. But he is not, I believe, by any stretch of the imagination, running things behind the scenes for UGA and for Kirby Smart. I just simply don't think that's what that is. But with that said, we'll kind of transition now and go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. A lot of you know, I just got back from my own Royal Caribbean cruise here, and man, it was so much fun, and it just gets me so ready to be on the Royal Caribbean cruise ship with all of you coming up here uh, very soon. We're going to be leaving out April 25th from Port Canaveral on the Independence of the Seas, going to be going to Nassau in the Bahamas, Perfect Day, Coco Cay, and boy, Perfect Day, Coco Cay, I mean, that alone is just so much worth everything. I mean, I had a chance to be there, and what I experienced was amazing. First of all, it's the largest freshwater pool in the Bahamas. That means it's a gigantic uh, swim-up bar. That's really probably one of those fun things is you get this huge pool, but you've also got the, like, the swim-up bar, and you get the DJ playing, and everybody's kind of going there, hanging around, and, and just having a blast. you got the cabanas uh, that are kind of like floating there above the water. at the slides that kind of go around to the water there. If you want one of those private cabanas, you can get one of those for the day. There's a thrill side. There's a chill side. Side. it's really one of the most cool ex- the coolest experiences i've had private island oasis right there in the bahamas exclusively for those on a royal caribbean cruise ship uh so much fun we get a chance to go to perfect day coco Cay when we're there in april so there's a little bit of time very limited space here for you to get a chance to be a part of the first ever cruise with dog nation so please go to dognation.com Click the link there. That'll get you to our friends, the Cruise and Vacation Authority. We're helping us all get all this booked up and get ready to go. The very first ever Dog Nation cruise, leaving out of Port Canaveral on Independence of the Seas, going to Nassau on the Bahamas, going to Perfect Day Coco Cay, enjoying all the great amenities on board there with Royal Caribbean. So dognation.com, check more of that out right there. All right, so with that said, let's transition now and let's get ready to go cruising on the SEC with Royal Caribbean here a little bit. A couple things I want to give you here. First of all, I thought there was a very interesting story at ESPN.com, kind of looking at the coaching stuff and kind of ahead of the upcoming season. And one of the things that the roundtable of riders kind of zeroed in on for a moment, which I thought, boy, this really does set up to be a pretty interesting year for the SEC, is looking at these coaches around the country who may be under the most pressure for this upcoming year. And it was amazing how many of those names were or SEC related. Now, one of those is obviously Brian Harson. We've done the Harson thing now a good bit. Almost lost his job the other day. Gets a chance to come back for year two. But I think the expectation level for Harson is so low right now that, and the the thought of him getting fired at the end of this next season, at the end of the end of the 2022 campaign, is so high right now that I'm honestly not even so sure that the Harson thing is really even all that interesting now. The Harson story appears to be almost completely written too expensive to buy out right now, too embarrassing for Auburn to do that. But eventually, that's the way that probably all of this is heading. It's a couple other guys in the SEC that the ESPN story touched on, which I think are far more interesting here. And both of them are very highly paid guys. Both of them will battle each other with two programs that have been kind of connected with each other kind of in the past. It is put up or shut up time for Jimbo Fisher there at Texas A&M. Now, I don't mean this is his last chance to have a good season. The truth is, a lot of times these there's a little bit of a delay in acquiring a number one class and seeing that level of success on the field come to full fruition. There's a little bit of a delay. It doesn't happen immediately the way that some people kind of think it, it's supposed to. But that's Jimbo's issue, issue here. There are a lot of Texas A&M fans who are not used to this kind of recruiting success. They just haven't had that. Now, Jimbo's been a pretty good recruiter, but this is an entirely different level of success. And these are big ego people, big money people. We understand all of that. No matter, Even if we have some questions about how much some of the NIL stuff actually played into A&M's recruiting success, we know big ego, big money here, expecting big results right, of the way, right away. What if that doesn't happen? Now, I believe that if A&M fans will remain patient with Jimbo, eventually they will see – the kind of success that you would expect with this kind of talent i think that will happen but sometimes impatience has a way of changing things sometimes impatience has a way of altering what would be the more obvious course here and jimbo has had a hard time winning they they haven't even had a 10 win season uh as of yet because they didn't play a full campaign there in 2020 that that jimbo has found winning games especially against good teams with winning records to be pretty difficult they beat alabama a year ago but that's the only team with a winning record they beat all year long they haven't really found quarterback as of yet is max johnson the transfer going to be that guy i don't know I, I i do think given the salary given the attention that comes from, from the recruiting success given the in some cases self-inflicted hysteria that's been created around some of the nil stuff 
seeing some dividends on the field pretty quickly from Jimbo, I think that's going to be pretty important. And watching what the reaction will be if it doesn't happen quite as fast as some Aggies fans have maybe been led to believe that it will, I think that will be pretty interesting. Conversely, much the same way, big salary for a guy like Brian Kelly. Now, Kelly's also one of those guys that kind of fits into the typical pattern of what Scott Woodward typically does, LSU athletic director, when he makes a hire. You go big, big name, overspend, and by doing so, you kind of take the idea of unmitigated disaster, you take that off the table. You eliminate that as a possibility, and you start off with a fairly acceptable basement, you know, ground level of, of what could happen. The ceiling could be very high, but in terms of the basement, the, the kind of the low-end projection, you don't have to worry about unmitigated disaster being being much of an issue there. But once again, sometimes that outside forces have a way of of affecting and influencing a normal progression. And in the case of Jimbo Fisher, you wonder, well, if, if some of the hype doesn't end up negatively influencing the outcome here. In the case of Brian Kelly, you're kind of left to wonder, is this a guy that can just be comfortable in his own skin there at LSU? Can he be a fit, not just in the SEC, which is a difficult deal, but in the state of Louisiana, which is kind of its own thing apart from everything else there as well? And, you know, obviously we've made fun of the uh, fake accent and Kelly's attempt to do all that. I thought his explanation on some of that was kind of uh, pretty weird there as well. That for Brian Kelly, who's clearly a good coach, but not always seemingly beloved by some of the people who spent time closest with him. If you are going to be a successful coach in the SEC, there's a certain sense in which you can't just be a good coach, but you've got to be kind of a dude there as well. You've got to kind of fit in with people, and you've got to feel – you've heard it said like politics, you know, who's the the candidate the person wants to have a beer with. Like there's a certain thing about SEC coaching that's kind of the same way. You have to have a little bit of magnetism to your personality, both to recruits and to the recruits' families and to boosters and everything else. And, you know, Brian Kelly, does he have that? You can kind of be the aloof – turn your nose up at people coach at Notre Dame because that's what other Notre Dame people kind of like to do too. But that's not what folks in the LSU and Louisiana want to do. And Brian Kelly, can he be that guy that that LSU fans kind of want their coach to be? He's certainly the opposite of Ed Orgeron. In one respect, that might be a good thing. But in other respects, that might not quite be such a good thing. So pretty good piece there at ESPN.com about some of these SEC coaches moving to the upcoming season who really do face a good bit of pressure. I would say, I would say Kelly, I would say Jimbo, very, very high on that list. I'll also give you this. Uh, on three on Twitter, put out a graphic from Vegas Insider looking at Heisman odds of the upcoming season. I think you see something interesting here. First of all, you have not had a you know back-to-back -back winner of the Heisman Trophy since Archie Griffith. And so obviously Bryce Young starts this year with a chance to really make history and put himself in a very rare category of success. But given the fact that it just hasn't happened very much, also speaks to, I would say, the unlikeliness that it happens here this year. So you start to wonder, well, if it's not Bryce Young again, and it could be, but if but if history holds and that doesn't happen, then where else do you go in all of this? Is it CJ Stratt at four to one? Is it Caleb Williams at nine to one? Is it the Texas running back Bijan Robinson at fifteen to one? Somehow DJ Uyunglele is still here at twenty to one. I think you can pretty easily eliminate Uyunglele. That's not going to happen. Uh, running back from Texas, that seems fairly easy to eliminate there as well. Then you get to the three quarterbacks at less than ten to one. I'm starting to get the impression that we are greatly overrating Caleb Williams. And I say this as someone who really believes in Williams' talent. But the idea that at 9-1, to one, you should be looking at him for the Heisman Trophy. Did you see the way he finished last season? Did you see the barely completing 50% of his passes type performance he had at Oklahoma? I've said this before, that if you look at the two new quarterbacks, the two new USC's, I'm not quite so sure that Spencer Rattler at South Carolina isn't set up for a better year than Caleb Williams is at uh, USC. And if I could short that stock at 9-1, to one, you better believe that I would, which leaves you fully squarely looking at C.J. Stroud there from Oklahoma, I should say from Ohio State there for a moment, which maybe it's just that simple. Maybe Ohio State just missing out on the playoff a year ago, maybe stepping back in and doing that this year. Maybe that's what we're on board to be able to do. But talk about pressure on coaches. What if that doesn't happen? What if um what if the CJ Stroud thing and you know obviously you know what they have around him there on, on the offense, what if that doesn't come into its full form here this upcoming season? What's the conversation around Ryan Day like? I mean, it feels like it was about five minutes ago that we were ranking Day as like the third best coach in the sport or something crazy like that, ranking ahead of even Kirby Smart in some respects. Boy. Kind of an interesting year, kind of a put-up-or-shut-up type thing for Ryan Day there at Ohio State, too, I would say, a little bit. Anyway, just something to think about. 
we'll make that cruiser on the sec courtesy of our friends at royal caribbean we'll also tell you this that right now we are in the midst of the great mardi gras celebration going on with our friends at marlowe's tavern and they're doing this in a special way giving you a taste of louisiana the big easy it's called the bayou and bourbon celebration two things i really love i love the great food of louisiana i certainly love bourbon and the bayou and bourbon celebration there at marlowe's got plenty of that chef john metz is always so creative with so many of his menu items really kicking it up here in a great way when it comes to these cajun flavors in fact if you look on the screen there for those of you watching on video you even see the new temporary spelling for marlowe's tavern getting rid of the OWS and going with the Cajun inspired L-E-A-U-X for Marlowe's Tavern. That's actually really fun. And they got some great new menu items as well, whether it's the roasted chicken and shrimp gumbo, the honey bourbon bread pudding, an unbelievable style dessert, or the uh, the uh, great non-style po' boy uh, deconstructed jambalaya. These are some weekly specials they kind of have going on there. Just so much fun available for both takeout and dine-in when it comes to the Bayou and Bourbon celebration. Of course, always great cocktails every time Marlowe's got something like this going on, including the special New Orleans-style hurricane cocktail right now there as well. So stop by your local Marlowe's Tavern and enjoy some of that, or go to marlowstavern.com. That's still spelled the normal way. It always is L O W S Marlowe's Tavern.com for all the great, great information on the very fun and terrific Bayou and Bourbon event going on at your local Marlowe's Tavern right now. All right. So, yesterday for our Golden Shoe, we gave you a tattoo themed Golden Shoe. Somebody getting the national championship tattoo, and that's always kind of a fun thing to see. Well, in response to that, we're going to take the tattoo game up a notch here. Let me show you this on the screen here. We'll give a golden shoe winner today to Jesse Smith, who says, honored both the Braves and UGA for their accomplishments. He says, your turn, Dog Nation Daily. Now, let me describe this. It says on the screen, Georgia, 2021 World Series champions, 2021 national champions. And the word Georgia, it's kind of half the Braves logo, half the Georgia logo. First of all, this truly is a work of art. This is beautiful beautiful very well done as far as me getting a tattoo i don't think i'd look good with a tattoo first of all i'm not really a tattoo guy people are probably not surprised to hear that i don't think i'd look very good with a tattoo i certainly wouldn't look as good with mine as jesse does with his so jesse congratulations to you you are a golden shoe winner today for a very cool tattoo in honor of the braves and the dogs by the way lousy stinking gators let's make fun of them on the way out the door how about 4,800 days? That's how long it's been since Florida's won a national championship. Long drought for them. Sucks to suck, I guess. And then Gator Hater Countdown back in Jacksonville. 242 days from right now. That is our Gator Hater Countdown. We can't wait to see George beat Florida again. And we can't wait to see you tomorrow right here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Engineered Solutions of Georgia. Have a great day, everybody. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. Of course, R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. That is how R.S. Andrews continues to put smiles on faces. They've been delivering smiles story after story, year after year. That is what R.S. Andrews does, and they can do that for you. All right, so let's get some comments on Facebook. And we'll probably be pretty quick today. Tuesdays are usually kind of a busy day for me. Um... So we'll be pretty quick with comments and then kind of bounce on after that. But I hope you're all doing great. And we'll try to still do a nice, healthy plenty here. But uh, on Facebook to begin, Chris Free says, no tattoos for me. That's a cool-looking tattoo. But I am probably not the tattoo guy. First of all, I feel like tattoos look good on dudes who have, like, the big rocked-up physiques. And you may not be aware of this, but if I were to remove my pullover, you would notice that I'm not exactly totally rocked out. I mean, you know, I'm listen. I try to stay in decent shape, but but I'm probably not completely, just completely rocked up on that. I also wonder to the folks who really like tattoos, like what happens when you get old? Like how does a ta- like we have a lot of people who are going to be 70 one day with like the tattoos. And listen, I'm not against you. Can do what you want. I'm happy to have you do what you want. But how are these tattoos going to look when people turn 70? Uh, I guess I kind of wonder that sometimes. Uh, let's see what else. Paul Lee weighing in here. Hugh Nash says, do you think Stacey Searles at some point during his interview said, hey, I'm a better choice than Will Friend? Yeah, that was the other kind of weird part about this was is for a while it seemed like a couple of like the, you know, the the finalists or the names we heard mentioned most frequently for this replacement for Matt Luke were both former Georgia assistants in the case of both Friend and Searles. Let's see what else. 
Ken Holcomb says that tattoo would look good on a T-shirt. I'm not a tattoo guy either. At my age, scars on my body have better stories. Yeah, I understand what you're saying about that for sure. As far as like the co-branded stuff, um, we have some of that, right? I mean, um, obviously, there's always like a, a big issue when you put two different brands on the same shirt about who gets the revenue and how they get split or whatever else. Um, you know, sometimes there's going to be bootleg people who do what they do. And frankly, that's not my business one way or another. But obviously, you know, like the Braves do make a co-branded hat with the Braves logo on the one side, the Georgia G on the other. And that's a really cool thing. But as far as like the co-branded World Series national championship stuff, if there is a way to do that and mass produce it, I know that it'd be very popular. Let's see what else. Uh, Keith folds ways in to say I've not always been on the Stetson Bennett hype train, but if he improves as much from last year to this year as he did from the year before, he could be in the Heisman conversation. Hot take, I know, just saying. Yeah, I mean, if you're the quarterback at Georgia returning as the national champion, I mean, it's not impossible to think that he could get into the Heisman discussion. I realize that Bennett's a little bit of a lightning rod. And, and listen, I mean, I'm not going to act like everything that Stetson Bennett's ever done in the quarterback position has been perfect. It hasn't always been. But on the array of possibilities for Bennett at Georgia, a very, very good season is certainly one of those possibilities. Uh, so, yeah, it would not be impossible for him to get into the Heisman conversation. He's not going to show up on the short list of um, uh, of Heisman favorites, probably. Probably. But, I mean... <laughs> Maybe that's kind of a good thing when you consider that Jamie Newman was once 12-1 to 1 to win the Heisman and never even took a snap. Maybe maybe not starting the year with big-time Heisman odds actually kind of you know speaks well for him. Greg Baker says, I hate doomers. How, how do you get joy in life from constantly sounding like Eeyore? Yeah, so I have a little bit of a theory about this. And I'm not trying to stir up trouble or anything like that. I'm really not. But here's what I've decided. Like, if you really watch this comment section on any of our platforms or, like, social media or something like that, like, there really is more negativity about Georgia football right now than logic would dictate should exist. That that if you kind of think about what you think the typical response would be to Georgia winning the national championship and Georgia coming back the following year as – preseason let's just be somewhat conservative and say preseason top five at least that the conversation around georgia on a daily basis is a little more negative than logic would dictate you expect it to be so i'm left to wonder well what is going on there like why is the convert like i said before like there's a weird level of criticism that kirby smart is receiving from people who think he's either incompetent or corrupt, incompetent in that he doesn't know how to make a successful coaching hire, or corrupt in that he's ignoring the best practices so he can take care of his cronies, his his coaching friends and coaching buddies. And I don't think it makes any sense to assume the worst of anyone absent of evidence, but Kirby Smart in particular, I don't think that makes very much sense. So I am left to wonder, I don't ask this question rhetorically, I mean this literally, like what is going on here? And so here's what I've decided. I think there are possibly two things, but one thing matters to me more than anything else. Here's the first thing, and this is the thing that matters more than anything else. That while it makes you miserable in life to go through, as Greg describes it as a doomer, that's a kind of interesting description there, a doomer, someone who just kind of like proclaims gloom and doom all the time, that's probably not a very successful recipe for a happy life, but it is a successful recipe to get a lot of attention on social media. And I really do believe that there's a huge part of the like strain of negativity that exists around Georgia football conversation that's really about little more than drawing attention to the person who's doing it. And this is not unique to college football. Like for those of you who follow <laughs> this is kind of a weird comparison, but financial markets and things like that, like cable news that covers like the market and things like that there's always going to be a market for the guy or the gal who comes on tv and says the market's about to crash you know there one of the jokes is 
you know, there are certain people who've predicted 20 of the last nine recessions. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if you just keep saying something bad's going to happen, eventually you're going to be right about it. And then you could say, Hey, I told you, but you've also been telling me that something bad was going to happen for a hundred years. And you've only been right this one time. So there's always going to be a little bit of clout to be chased by saying that danger lurks around the corner. And I, this is not just true in college football. It's true in lots of things. Uh, and I do truly believe that's what some of this is about. Here's the other thing I think th- things going on here. There are a lot of people who can never give Stetson Bennett credit for anything because to do so would mean admitting they were wrong about something they said about Bennett in the past, as if anybody cares. Like some people get so wrapped up in the ego part of that that they um, they can never ever backtrack and say, well, I guess turn come to find out Stetson Bennett was a little better than I thought he was. Now, not all Georgia fans feel that way. I've gotten plenty of messages from UGA fans who've been like, yeah, you know what turned out? Stetson Bennett was better than I thought he was, and I sure am happy about that. Some Georgia fans seem to be able to say that. Not every Georgia fan seems to be able to. And when it comes to like the strain of negativity that exists within some conversation, I think there's some of that there. I, I, I do. And I think some of that's even related to some of the Mike Bobo stuff there too, where they are just some Georgia fans who've kind of turned hating Mike Bobo into a personality, and therefore they can't quite ever let go of that. Um, let's see what else. Christopher Rule says the Debbie Downer is lurking at all times in any Georgia Bulldogs online social media group. I kind of noticed that too, even a couple months after national championship. So if that archetype exists, there must be a reason why it exists. And I said before, I I think that there's some fairly compelling evidence this is someone who gets attention for bringing that negativity or someone who – gets to save face from an ego standpoint about maybe some previous things that have been said. Green Soldier says that when you mention Matt Luke's career, think about what he had to deal with at Ole Miss and then try to fill the shoes of one of the best offensive line coaches in the game. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, uh, Green. I really don't. That that there is a lot he was asked to do. You know, being a head coach in the SEC is not an easy thing, but stepping in for Matt for uh, for Sam Pittman after all the success that Pittman had, that's definitely not an easy thing to do right there that that Luke certainly faced some challenges. And I think he comes across as a really good dude. Uh, and he's probably a really sharp football mind. And much the same way Georgia fans are left to hope that, hey, maybe the Searles track record ends up not really being a good predictor for what he has here at Georgia. There's also a chance that Matt Luke, who I, if I had to guess, probably coaches again somewhere at some point in time. There's also a really good chance that a guy like this who just clearly knows football wouldn't be in the position that he was if he didn't, that maybe just works out for him differently. I mean, we gave you the example yesterday of Kevin Steele. Go look at Kevin Steele's time as defensive coordinator. At one point in time, he was the butt of jokes, and now he's really thought to be one of the top defensive minds in the game, that over the course of time, there's just sometimes very little explanation for why it works out one place and doesn't work out somewhere else. So I am certainly not going to take the two years that that Luke had here at Georgia and say, well, that just proves that he can't coach. First of all, I thought it was at least good, if not quite great. Um, but but you're right. There's also a lot of extenuating circumstance around all that there, too. Uh, William Perry says, uh, where's the line between being realistic and being a Debbie Downer? I think it's a fair question to ask. And uh, obviously, there you know, there are some people who kind of want to be realistic here, here's where I would draw the line on something like that, that realism requires a willingness to both acknowledge things that you think you're right about, but it also acknowledge things that you either don't know or maybe turned out to be wrong about. That's where like realism comes in. And I think that when we go to like the cartoonish extremes on one side or the other, that's where it becomes something different. That's just my, I guess, um, answer to that. Let's see what else. Memphis Dog brings up an interesting point. He says, the pass protection was excellent under Luke. The run blocking was excellent under Pittman. Here's the thing, though, if you want to go back and look at. um, There were a couple of those, like, run blocking stats in the last year of Pittman in 2019 that were maybe not quite so great as you remembered. I don't blame Pittman for that, nor do I blame the offensive line. The offensive line had three draft picks, two first-rounders. Both your tackles were first-rounders. But the offense in general had become so predictable that 
Georgia wasn't just quite lining up and mauling people the way that it had in the past. In fact, it becomes hard to remember this now, but there were a pocket of Georgia fans when Georgia was transitioning to a new offensive line coach who were kind of hoping for a little newer version of the offensive line. There were a lot of Georgia fans who were kind of hoping, oh, maybe the offensive line will get a little smaller and get a little bit more athletic. And there there was some talk about that at the time, that when you think about Georgia not quite running the ball quite as well, not quite mauling people in the running game quite so much, that didn't just change in 2020 in Matt Luke's first year. That kind of started to change a little bit in 2019. Once again, I don't blame Pittman for that. It was a failed Georgia offense in 2019, and I'm not even saying Pittman could save it. But it's important to note that some of the regression for the Georgia rushing attack actually happened before Sam Pittman left. Uh, Mr. Strickland said Matt Luke got his ring and, his, and now he's rich. Maybe that's all he wanted. <laughs> Could be the case. <laughs> to be rich and have a championship, that's, a, that's, that's two pretty good things to have. Let's see what else. Let me go to dognation.com for a minute. And we're going to have to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Tan Man says, who thinks Kevin Steele is, quote, one of the top defensive minds in the game? Well, to be fair, he was a very coveted high. I mean, listen, you can think what you want about him. I don't, frankly don't care. But, I mean, he was clearly a coveted defensive coordinator when Miami took him away from Maryland. The Auburn folks want to make him the head coach there. <laughs> the point is his coaching reputation seems to be much higher now than it was recently as a few years ago. Um. West Georgia fan, West Georgia dog fan on the idea that Stacy Searles is just a stopgap. He, he, here's the, kind of the thought I'm starting to have, though. I mean, Georgia replaced four different assistant coaches this offseason, right? I'm not quite so sure that anybody is much more than a stopgap anymore. Whether it's a young up and comer who's on his way up to become a head coach or a young or an older guy kind of maybe on his way out, you know. If, we, if we're going to presume that Matt Luke's decided he wanted to retire, maybe that's an example of that. I'm not quite so sure anybody is anything more than just a short-term stopgap. I mean, go back and look at what you know some recruits have said recently about their frustration of having to get to know a new position coach every other year with one of these programs. Like This is the kind of thing that recruits are saying is a very real part of their process right now. So part of the reason why I'm not that stressed out about Stacey Searles as – how good of a recruiter is he going to turn out to be is who knows if anybody sticks around that long anymore. Who knows if anybody's going to be here for more than a year or two before they're looking to move on somewhere else. That's just kind of what it is right now. Now, Georgia's had longstanding, you know, relationship with Glenn Schumann and, and, and Del McGee and others. So it's not, it's not true that every coach is a short-term proposition, but a lot of them turn out to be. So when it comes to Searles here, I'm not thinking five years down the road, not because I think of him as a stopgap, but because I think of most position coaches right now as a relatively short-term proposition. So for me, all I care about is, hey, get something out of the guys you have, and if you do that, then everything else should take care of itself, whether you're, you're the guy recruiting them or not. So yeah, I am definitely in kind of a short-term mindset on assistant coaches right now because that's just kind of what seems to be the thing. Let's get a couple more. Lee Burroughs and some of the co-branded stuff between the dogs and the Braves. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a cool thing if you can get away with selling it. Tan Man says, why am I wearing a jacket to cover up the nice tan? I don't know. I threw on the uh, the uh, the black cover-up today. Maybe I should have gone full-on tan. Uh, I'm pretty proud. I feel like I got a nice full-body tan, uh, which is probably more than y'all want to know. But I feel pretty good about the tan situation these days. Um Let's see what else. What else is going on? Uh, Harkle also giving you the shout-out to Sepp Straka. Yeah, we talked about Sepp yesterday. Big, big uh, win for him on the PGA Tour. You'd love to be able to see that. Let's see what else. Robert Barnes says Matt Luke just needed a break. He was under tons of pressure at Ole Miss with all the mess they had going on. And he hit the ground running when he came to us. Yeah, I mean, maybe it is that simple. And as I said before, absent strong evidence otherwise, you sort of have to take a guy at his word, and that's what Luke says he wants to do. But there's a suspicion on my part that this may not be the last time he coaches. But who knows? 
Christopher Rule says every coach that comes to Georgia needs the Georgia being on their resume, and then they need to have success in Athens. Yeah, I mean, it can be a great springboard to the next thing if that's what you want it to be. It can be that for sure. So uh, good comments here today. we got to get ready to bounce out of here for today. We'll try to do more comments tomorrow. Uh, Tuesdays are always kind of a busy day here. So let's get ready to say goodbye for today and remind you to check out the Atlanta Journal-Constitution online, AJC.com. A lot to follow there. There's obviously a lot going on in the world, and you can keep up with all of that. Uh, also, registration begins for the race lottery for the AJC Petrie Road Race. So AJC.com for a lot more on that. Uh, and you can vote on the, the T-shirt design, which is always a really cool thing. Also, an interesting story from Chip yesterday regarding some weird, I guess, fraud allegations uh, somehow, some way connected to uh, to some UGA donors who may have gotten kind of tripped up in this. So we'll let you read that at AJC.com from Chip. And maybe coming close to the end of the, of the Major League Baseball lockout here, we'll find out if that indeed happens. And what are the Falcons going to do with the eighth overall pick in the upcoming NFL draft? That as well ajc.com for a lot more from our friends at the atlanta journal constitution also big thanks to rs andrews making the rs andrews cool down possible find them online rsandrews.com if your water heater goes out in many cases rs andrews can replace it for you the same day so check them out online and we'll check you out tomorrow dog nation daily presented by engineered solutions of georgia and the rs andrews cool down after that have a great day everybody